This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight for what I believe will be a truly outstanding lecture. Uh, my name is Neil Calder. I'm the Director of Communication at the Stanford Linear Accelerator uh, Center. I'd first of all like to congratulate Pat Devaney, who is over there, who is the head of the Scientific Outreach Office of Stanford University for her impeccable timing, because we fixed this date up for this talk many months ago, but she knew instinctively that this morning there were going to be articles in the San Jose Mercury News, in the San Francisco Chronicle, and it was going to be on television, uh, both tonight and, in fact, last night. Perfect timing. This has been an outstanding series of lectures. It's been a tremendous success. I think the format you couldn't find a nicer place in the whole world to listen to uh, talks. And again, Pat, <clears throat> she's hiding there, but congratulations. There have been some really outstanding lectures. The last one on earthquakes with Mark and Mary Lou Zubak. Uh, the final talk in the series will be on August the 31st. And again, a fantastic subject. This is the science, ethics, and politics of stem cell research. Two great speakers. This is uh, Professor Julie Baker, a genetics professor here, and a law professor, Hank Greeley. And Flip Pizzo, who is the dean of the medical school, will be introducing them. So another wonderful evening to look forward to. But let's talk about tonight. Uwe Berkman is a product of modern science. He was born in Germany in uh, the Black Forest, which is very, very famous for its scientists and its cake. <laughs> he, he took his first degree at the University of Hamburg, but then moved across to the States to take his doctorate at Stony Brook. Uh, he then went back to Europe to work at the European Synchrotron Radiation uh, Facility in Grenoble, back to America to work uh, at Berkeley, and has finally, I hope, come to rest here at Stanford, where he works at our synchrotron radiation facility at SLAC. The talk he's going to give, you will see, is extreme interest because it brings together the weirdest combinations of classicism, of ancient geometry, and the most advanced uh, scientific facilities that exist at the moment. To read some of the oldest possible uh, documents, we use some of the most outstanding advanced scientific equipment uh, which is available. He will show how, for the first time since antiquity, we, in the last few days, just up the hill at Slack, have been able to read works by Archimedes, which nobody has seen uh, since that time. It's an amazing story. I will say no more. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Uwe Beckman. Uwe. <clears throat> Good evening. And thank you very much for all for coming uh, to what, what a, is a wonderful evening, actually. I was worried last night that it's going to be cold, but the legendary California weather has not disappointed us. As I speak, <clears throat> we have the, um, one of the pages of the Archimedes parchment in our X-ray beam, and we are scanning. and. My colleagues have to watch over that everything is going OK, and I'm sure no one, no one of them is going to call me in the next 45 minutes. Um, the journey started much earlier, but let me tell you about an event on July 7, which was on the first page of the New York Times. The Danish scholar, Johann Ludwig Heiberg had discovered that in the library of Constantinople, in the midst of a prayer book, there were drawings and writings of Archimedes. He tried to get the book 
out of the library, but he was not allowed to do so. So he took his camera and took photos of it. He then transcribed it and the text known as um, parts of treatises of Archimedes in the palimpsest. The book disappeared after that and didn't resurface. In fact, it was thought that it was lost. Archimedes was born in 287 BC and he was tragically killed by a Roman soldier at the age of 74. The soldier hadn't obeyed his orders to capture him alive. He was a legend in his time. He, was, he is even today considered as one of the greatest three mathematicians of all times and certainly one of the greatest minds of all times. As a student, he was sent to Alexandria to learn the teachings of Aristotle and Euclid. Euclid himself is an incredibly famous person. His concept of dimensionality was thought to describe the world until Einstein realized that, in fact, one needs a fourth dimension, time, to describe properly the theory of relativity. Archimedes invented many things, amongst them the so-called Archimedes screw. It is a cylindrical pump system uh, where within, with a screw you can pump water from a lower level to an upper level. It is still used in many countries around the world, mostly developing countries. Archimedes also was the person who was first calculating the circumference of a, the circumference, and with that, the, the number pi. He didn't measure it, he calculated it, and he used a series of pro approximations of different geometrical ch shapes uh, to do that, and he got an, a very good number out of it, uh, better than anyone before. Um, one of his other very important work was that he described the law of the lever, which tells you that how far you have to play, place two different objects on a balance in order to get equilibrium. There's a famous quote where Archimedes supposedly said, give me a place to stand and I can lift the earth, just showing that at, I at an infinite distance, in principle, theoretically, you can lift an extremely heavy object. Archimedes is most known for his so-called Eureka moment. This came about that the king of Syracuse was suspecting that the wreath which his goldsmith made for him was not made out of pure gold. And they, they didn't know how to find out whether he was right or wrong, and so they went to Archimedes to help them to solve the problem. And the legend has it that Archimedes, taking a bath, all of a sudden jumped up, crying, Eureka, I found it, running naked through the streets of Sicily. We, we think this is a legend because if his work on floating bodies is so complex and advanced that it's hard to believe that over a discovery of a much lesser significance, he could have been so excited. <laughs> Nevertheless, he found out that, in fact, the wreath was not made out of pure, pure gold, and that didn't sit very well with the king, as you can imagine. Archimedes had a friend um, with the name of Eratosthenes, who himself is a very, very famous person, because it was Eratosthenes who first estimated the size, the circumference of the Earth. And he did it in a very beautiful experiment by measuring, um, he went to Aswan, which is at the, at the Tropic of Cancer, on 
the solstice, on the summer solstice, where the sun is exactly uh, perpendicular and there is no shadow. And he knew that in Alexandria, on the same day, at the same time, there was a seven degree shadow. From the caravan travelings, he knew the distance between Alexandria and Aswan, and all he had to do is relate this distance to seven degrees and then multiply it by 360, and he got the circumference of the Earth of about 40,000 kilometers, plus or minus maybe 5%. Very accurate. Columbus, when he was setting out to discover India, did not know the size of the Earth. Archimedes wrote a letter to his friend Eratosthenes. Let me read that to you. Archimedes to Eratosthenes, greetings. Since I know you are a diligent and excellent teacher of philosophy and greatly interested in any mathematical invest investigation that may come your way, I thought it might be appropriate to write down and set forth for you a certain special method. Later on, he continues, I presume there will be some among the present as well as future generations who by means of the method here explained will be enabled to find other theorems which have not yet fallen our share. It is, it is the first word, these are the first words of Archimedes' most outstanding work called The Method of Mechanical Theorems. And it is the, uh, due to the sheer luck of discovering the Archimedes palimpsest that this work is even known to us because it has survived only in the Archimedes palimpsest in the manuscript found by Heiberg in 1906. The significance of this work is far-reaching. Archimedes was able to deal with infinity in his work on the mechanics, on the, the method of mechanical theorems. He was also using a physical intuition, a physical thought experiment in order to balance objects on a lever like he, like he describes in his Law of the Lever. And by doing that, he was able to calculate the center of mass of rather complex objects. It is an outstanding accomplishment uh, which rivals the, the work of Newton almost 2,000 years later, even though in a, done in a very different way. And it has been speculated by many what, where we would be today if in the Renaissance Galileo or Da Vinci or others would have had access to the work of Archimedes on the method of mechanical theorems. It is the introduction to his work which is scanning right now at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. And even if we will only contribute a couple of words, and we hope to do more than that, it is absolutely worth our while to do that. Any of the work by Archimedes survived through a lot of luck, like it is always involved, because Archimedes wrote on papyrus scrolls. Later, the format was changed, similar to when you change from your vinyl discs to a CD, unfortunately, many of your good old records are not going to make it on a CD, and it's only a question of time when those will be lost forever, unfortunately. But that happens always when there's a dramatic change of media. Fortunately, uh, as far as we know, at least some, and we don't know more, of Archi Archimedes' works survived on a, in form of parchment books. They were written with an ink, made out of, out of a gall, which you can also find in the oak trees around the Stanford campus, and mixed with water and iron sulfate, which gave a very dark and black color. And the parchment was mostly made out of sheepskin or goatskin. It has been written almost everywhere that the Archimedes parchment is made out of goatskin, and I think this is a little bit disputed. We have one of the experts uh, with us right now, and I don't think the, it's a completely clear answer. Nevertheless, 
Um, it is important, and the reason why I'm standing here today is it is important to note that the ink which was used contains a lot of iron. But the parchment, the Archimedes palimpsest, had disappeared after World War I, and it, it couldn't be found. And in fact, it was thought to, to have been lost forever until it resurfaced and was finally auctioned in 1998 and bought by a private investor at an auction at Christie's. And it is thanks to the interest and gratefulness, gra gracefulness of the, of the owner that the book got into the hands of the curator of the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, who started an integrated effort of conservation and imaging. And since 1998, the book was taken apart, and the collaboration of many people has started since to try the most modern technologies to try to read any of the possible words of Archimedes' texts. It was found that the Archimedes palimpsest contains not only the work on the method of mechanical theorems, which, was, which is it's the only place where that is, it contains the only Greek version of the, his famous work on floating bodies. It also contains the only version of an ancient game called the Stomachion. And it's a complicated game, similar to Tangram, where you have 20 different shapes and you can place them in many different orders. And Archimedes was one person who was fascinated by, by the uh, Stomachion. When the, when the parchment reappeared, there were problems. First of all, some of the pages were in extreme, in fact, many pages were in extremely bad condition. The climate uh, in the storage area since um, the uh, 1906 findings was not ideal. There was mold. Um, there was even some parts were even burned slightly. The outer pages, the first page, for example, was completely abrased. It, it was in really very, very poor condition. And um, a lot of the text uh, was even, uh, couldn't be even read as well as when Heiberg saw it. Um, the difference is that Heiberg, who could read it maybe a little bit better, he didn't have the most advanced equipment to image it. So in addition to this problem that the pages are st were slowly starting to deteriorate, there was another um, big problem. Four of the pages contained medieval miniatures. And by looking at the miniatures, it wasn't immediately clear whether those were originals um, or whether they were put on later. And it didn't take long to find out that they were almost exact copies of a book published in the Bibliothèque Nationale in pa Paris in 1929. They fit one to one. Since about a month we know now that they had to be published, they had to be actually forged on top of the pages after 1938 because of the composition of the ink. Uh, where some parts were only available after 1938. Yet today, in fact, um, our team uh, found another forgery of the same type, and the circle of who, could the who was possibly the forger is closing tighter and tighter right now. The imaging effort was very successful. A technique called multispectral imaging was used to bring out the smallest differences in colors between the two inks. And with that technique, and to, to some part also based on ultraviolet light, a lot of the text could be read better than Heiberg could have done it. Still, several very important parts of the writings were missing. In particular, parts which were written under the forgeries. It was, it was considered at one point and tried whether one could possibly scrape off the forgeries, but that was not an option 
the parchment was in such a bad shape that that would have completely damaged the parchment. So it was decided against it. Other pages were just, there was just no color difference. In some cases, the mold had completely covered the writings and you couldn't see the writings at all. I learned about this project when I was at a conference in Germany in, 19, in 2003. Uh, and this conference was on photosynthetic splitting of water into oxygen. And my research is actually uh, using modern X-ray spectroscopic techniques to study the little, sm tiny little machines, we call them catalysts, who perform these amazing reactions. And the splitting of water is one of the big, still big unsolved puzzles, and it's arguably the most important catalytic reaction on Earth because it is responsible for essentially all the oxygen in our atmosphere. What we do with our X-ray technique, we look at small quantities of metals like manganese or iron. And when I read in this magazine article, which was uh, in a magazine pointed out by my mother, uh, it's a typical thing when you visit home, your mom always has a stable with things which you are supposed to read. You, usually you fall asleep, but with a, with a jet lag, um, I was awake for a little bit longer and I stumbled about, um, um, about this article on um, the Archimedes palimpsest. And when I read that there's iron in the ink, I immediately said to myself, if we can see iron in spinach, we should be able to see iron in ink. Now, that was the reason why I contacted the Abigail Kwan, she's the conservator, and Will Noel, he's the director of this project at the Walters Art Museum, and I told them my crazy idea. I said, it's very easy. You send me the book, I'll take the world's most powerful x-rays, and we just scan it. No problem, no problem. <laughs> that, that, that was pretty much his reaction as well. But some people say that x-rays is a non-invasive technique, and to some extent it's true. We all go to the dentist and get a dental x-ray, and, and we get our chest x-rays as well. And, and most, of it, most of us are, have, have done well with that. So it is now a question to convince first a museum and conservator, and also of course the owner, that with your powerful x-ray beam, uh, you are not going to damage the parchment. And, and that was some effort. Uh, but we were able to do that. Let me tell you a little bit about our X-ray beam and also about the technique we are using to image because what we are doing with the Archimedes uh, palimpsest is not a chest X-ray or dental X-ray where we look at the transmission. We use a different technique. First about the source. Uh, the Stanford uh, Linear Accelerator is known for its outstanding programs in high energy physics in smashing particles to, into each other. And there was, is one ring called the spear ring, uh, which has been famous in its own right and part of the discovery and Nobel Prize of very important discoveries. Uh, and in the 70s, some uh, X-ray scientists realized that some of the radiation, uh, in fact, the X-rays, which are produced when accelerating a, an electron on, on a round path, are really not helping the high energy physicists, but they might make a good source of x-rays, maybe a better source than, than an x-ray tube, a commercial x-ray tube. So they were allowed to dig a little hole into the ring and let the x-rays out. And that was, if I'm not mistaken, in the 70s, we have one of the fathers sitting next to me. He, he, might, he might correct me. And in fact, it is true that the Stanford uh, Synchrotron Radiation Project was the original name, was the first uh, place in the world where there, are, where there were several dedicated stations to use these powerful x-rays. And since then, there has been truly a revolution with x-ray uh, synchrotrons. Uh, that you can find them almost, or you can find them on ev almost every continent. You can find them um, in the United States. There are four very large labs, and they have truly contributed enormously to the science. Um, what we 
what, what you can do in a synchrotron, other than in a with a commercial X-ray tube, you can produce a very collimated, straightforward X-ray beam of enormous intensity and brightness. In fact, the brightness, which is a, is a measure of a collimated uh, intensity in the forward direction of an X-ray beam, is a million, ten million times brighter than the sun. It's an enormous uh, scientific tool, and it is, is used across many disciplines. The way we use it to try to read the text of Archimedes is a technique called X-ray fluorescence. And what happens in X-ray fluorescence is a tiny beam, uh, our beam has the size of a human hair, is hitting the book, and when it hits an iron particle, it starts to send out an, a fluorescence glow. If it hits an, a particle of a different chemical element, let's say a manganese particle, or a carbon, or a calcium particle, each of them have their own characteristic X-ray glow at a slightly different color. We can call it color even though X-rays are invisible. And we have a detector which can pick out these different colors. So rather than trying to send in X-rays and just look how much of them are absorbed, what you do is you send in X-rays and you put a detector which looks at only one color. And that only one color can be, for example, iron or it can be calcium. You choose an element which you know is in the ink and you hope is not in the, in the parchment. And that is the, that is the principle about this technique. All you need to do now is you take your very small x-ray beam, you put it on the parchment, and you scan your parchment through, then go to the next line, scan it through, and each time when you scan it through, you record all the data, and then you reconstruct the data in a digital image, uh, and you hope you line it up correctly, otherwise it, it's, look, and we, we have struggled with that originally, and then you reconstruct the image, and what you get is rather than uh, an x-ray chest x-ray image, you get an x-ray iron map or an x-ray calcium map or any element you want. That is the, that is the trick which we have used uh, to look at the writings by Archimedes. And we have started this project with the first test a little bit more than one year ago in May 2005. And it has been rather successful. We first were able to show that it works. You can actually bring out text uh, underneath other drawings, for example, or underneath mold, which, uh, which you cannot see with any other uh, technique. In the original tests, uh, we were focusing on a particular set of pages to make sure that we understand all the different aspects of the technique very well and, and to demonstrate that it works. After that, we started to try uh, to really read some of the very important pages. And this was started earlier this year. We were able, uh, for example, and I'll give you some of our uh, results from earlier this year, and I will also give you some of the latest results, which one of them is as early as last night. Um, first, we were able to look at folio, which, which, which the um, curators call folio, page one of the Archimedes Palimpsest. Page one is like in any book, the most abused page. As you know from your paperbacks, you give it to someone and after 20 times it gets worse and worse. And so it was no wonder that even when Heiberg in 1906 started to look at the Archimedes Palimpsest, he couldn't see much of page one at all. And if you look at it now, you basically see nothing. You don't see any text. And Page one is very important because it contains the final proposition of Archimedes of, on his work on floating bodies. 
It is his most complex proposition. That is agreed upon by scholars. And what we found is that some of the diagrams on this page are actually in a different order than in the Latin translation, which, were, which is the only thing which we knew before. And currently, uh, Revil Netz, who is a Stanford professor of classics, his office is no less, uh, no more than maybe 500 yards from here, uh, is working very hard to compare the different translations and to, and to um, establish the significance of the Latin translation and of this early work. And, and there are uh, clearly differences of that. When you leave today, um, I have for you three uh, images, and they will be at the stands. One of them is the normal view of the page one, and the other one is the X-ray iron image. So rather than trying to describe what you see on that, help yourself and have a look on it. I would also like to ask those who have access to the internet um, to maybe not take a page and leave it to those who might not have such a good access because uh, there is a website called archimedespalimpsest.org and you can download images as many as you want. It is updated almost on a daily basis. So please uh, leave some of those uh, folios for those who don't have uh, such an easy access. On the first page, there was another surprise for us. The, it is a prayer book. So typically, when someone finishes to write a book, he writes down the date, sometimes the place or the church uh, to which he wants uh, to give the book. And we knew the date before. That was one of the parts which could, could be read. It was the uh, 14th of April in 1229. But we didn't know the name. At Slack, we now found his name. His name is Johannes Myronas. And he was Greek, like, like was expected. Um, and now the hunt is on to see whether he has palimpsested any other important works. His name is still a little bit, uh, his exact pronunciation is still debated by the scholars. They have to sort this out. Keep in mind, um, he, um, even then, people were using different types of strokes and handwritings, and it is not always clear completely just from looking at one image or another. If you don't have many letters to compare, um, what, what letter is it really symbolized? That is, by the way, also true for the writings uh, which contain the work of Archimedes, and, it, and therefore there are currently actually three experts around the world who are um, most familiar in reading this, this, uh, the, the Archimedes text. And there's another set of experts who are more familiar in reading the biblical texts. Yesterday, we were looking at our images. And um, we have currently scanning uh, pages of Archimedes' work on floating, uh, of Archimedes' work, the method of mechanical theorems. And there was a drawing which we saw from the, from the multispectral image, imaging, which just looked like a triangle. And we were scanning through, we were looking through our scans, and we looked at the iron signal, and it didn't, we didn't see very much. But then we looked at the calcium signal, and out came the complete diagram. It was not just a triangle. In fact, it were two, two triangles together and surrounded by a circle and surrounded by two square lines. And the circle went down and another two square lines. I have printed that as a third handout. You will be amongst the first who have ever seen this. And you can take it with you tonight. Or you can go to the website and load it down. This is um, a new diagram of the most significant work of one of the most significant thinkers. And if that was all we, we found in this 12 days, that we would be happy with that. And we hope we have found maybe some more. Let me, let me now thank first 
are all my, um, first of all, my mother and my parents, of course, <laughs> to point this out to me. Um, but also, I would like to point out what an incredible in experience it has been for me. I, I'm, not an, I'm not a historian. I'm not a scholar. I have never thought about looking into uh, ancient texts. But it has been a true pleasure. We have an incredible team at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center and at the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Lab because I have involved people not just from the Synchrotron Lab, from around the whole lab. Everyone who, whom I asked was extremely helpful and, and jumped on it. And, and there are many efforts involved uh, from climatization of the Hutch to the fastest possible readout of the scanning device and many, many more things. Our team consists of scientists from all around the world. We have an imaging processing expert who works at Boeing in Maui. He's a very lucky person. <laughs> we have scholars from the, we have scholars we have uh, around the world who get the images daily. We have um, Revil Nets, who is a Stanford classics professor. Will Noel, who is the director uh, of this, of this uh, imaging project. And there are many more, and there, there are too many to name. And I'm, I'm really grateful to all of them. It is not only a lot of, um, it's not only a great team, but we also laugh a lot. If you would ever come by the Beamline, we are ha we really having a lot of fun. Uh, finally, I would like to express my thanks to, um, first, the owner, the anonymous owner of the Palimpsest, who is not, not so much supporting our work here at Slack, but he is supporting a lot of the work which goes on in preparation and also for travel to come uh, to our laboratory. And he's also um, the person who is actually um, interested in, in publishing and publicizing these writings and making them accessible to everyone in order to, to read what com comes out. And I think uh, th this is a, a very noble cause and, and we are very happy to have this collaboration. And finally, I would also like to thank, of course, um, my laboratory, Stanford University, and the Department of Energy, uh, who is the main funding agency for our work. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my boss, the SSIL director, Joe Storr, who lets me do whatever I want. And I would like to thank you. What is the basic difference of uh, invention between what Archimedes found on the circumference of the Earth versus uh, Galileo found about the Earth? Um, are you talking about the, the, the circle? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, don't think, I, I, I don't think I'm able to answer the question. I can, I can answer uh, how Archimedes calculated the circle. What he did is he, he first used, said, OK, let's take, we ta let's take a circle. And let me put a triangle inside the circle. And I can calculate the length of the th three sides of the triangle. And I know that the circle is all outside. It has to be longer than that. Then he split each of the sides of the triangle in two sides, arriving to a hexagon. And he knew how to calculate the, the length of the hexagon of each side. And he still knew that the circle was still outside, but much closer. Then he took the hexagon and took each side, divided it by two again, and he had a dodecahedron. And he continued, and it was still inside. He continued that until 96. But Archimedes wasn't satisfied. He said, now I have the lower limit. I want the upper limit. And he did the same thing from the outside. And so he, he brought it down, and he got it to a, a remarkable precision, to a precision which is still used today to build houses, for example. And I cannot comment on Galileo. Thank you. Please. That is a very good question. Uh, and the most intriguing, uh, the question was, where does the calcium come from? And the honest answer is, right now, we do not know. Uh, the most intriguing is that some parts of the Archimedes 
writings have iron and calcium. Some of them have mostly calcium and some of them have mostly iron. We think it has to do with the side on which it was written, the, because parchment has two sides. One side is the flesh side and one side is the, is the hair side. It might also have to do uh, with, uh, for example, there are the, some of the forgery pages which have later on paintings on it. When you look at it, the, the signal comes also out clearer with calcium, but when you go to the text which is beyond the forgeries, there's really, uh, there's really not much calcium. So it is a puzzle to us. At this point, we are just happy to use them both, but we, we truly would like to find out. Um, what medium was uh, Archimedes' documentation before it was transcribed to the, uh, the parchment? Yeah. He, his original, uh, he was originally writing on papyrus scrolls. And um, I think it was um, in the year 400, roughly, that the transcription to papyrus started. And it, it was kind of a revolution because um, you now can put, uh, if you think about the, the, the amount of information you can book, put in a, in a book of, let's say, 200 pages versus a papyrus roll, you, you have a clear advantage. How long is the x-ray beam? The full mile or a foot or how far? Uh, uh, thank you. That is an, that is an excellent question. I, I hope I answered correctly. The, the ring is about 200 uh, meter circumference. Um, it's an electron ring, and it has uh, it has many ports, and these ports let out the X-ray. So we have 25 at Stanford. We have 25 stations, and at each of those stations, you have your own laboratory. And we have at any given time, as right now, we have 25 groups of researchers from around the world doing research on all these different stations. So so our Synchrotron here is about a little bit more than 200 meters, and they come in different sizes. If you want to have an, uh, if you have a large one, which which is better for higher energies, they are typically larger. The largest one in the world is in Japan with one point, roughly 1.5 kilometers. And if you want to go to lower energies, let's say to ultraviolet and soft X-rays, you go, for example, across the bay to the Lawrence Berkeley lab. They have a synchrotron called the Advanced Light Source, and that is about half the size of the one here, and it's more specialized on lower energy. So, so they, they come in different classes, and currently the, the class, which is the typical size of the, of the Stanford synchrotron, which, by the way, has a brand new ring in it as well, is the most popular. So, so it, of, the, of the current... Uh, Buildings under construction, one in England, one in France, one in Australia, one in Canada, they are all of the same class as, as our synchrotron, about 250 meter uh, circumference. Thank you. Um, has any other uh, electromagnetic spectrum frequencies been tried other than X-rays? And uh, there'll be advantages of others that you can compare with as well. Yeah. Well, th that is an, an excellent question. and. The multispectral imaging uh, is, of course, uh, also part of the electromagnetic spectrum and the ultraviolet as well. So, so, so far, um, it has been tried to use optical lights, frequencies we can see, and then the trick was there to take advantage of small differences in color and then mix different illumination colors in a an, in an judicious way in order to bring out the differences as large as possible. Also, ultraviolet light has been used and I think currently there are some discussions of going to infrared, uh, trying some infrared techniques. It has been proposed, and we, are going, we have to see what comes out of it. The friend of Archimedes who calculated the circumference of the Earth knew it was round. Why then, even up to Christopher Columbus's time, there are those who said, and even today some, that <laughs> the earth is flat. <laughs> that, is an, that is the best question. Um, humans don't always like to know things. Oh, when you take a picture of the page, do you get the picture of the ink on the other side too, or does it scatter? No, um, the, when we take a picture of the page, uh, we actually get um, the same as if you would hold your, 
newspaper into the sun, we, we, get the, we get the picture also of the other side. In some cases, that can be good. For example, on the forgery pages, it's a very good thing because it turns out that by, image, by going through the forgeries, which, which contain a lot of heavy uh, metals like there's zinc and copper in there, you get less signal than when you go through the back door through the parchment. In other cases, it disturbs because you are going to see now four texts. You see the Archimedes text, you see the biblical text on top, and then the, from both sides, and it can make the reading very hard. So what we, have what we are doing is we have two detectors. We have one detector which measures from behind, one detector which measures from the front, and there's a slight difference in the signal strength of those two detectors, and our, our imaging processor from Hawaii uh, is able to you, he has developed an algorithm with which he can actually bring out the different sides in two different colors. And so you see the front side in red and the, and the, and the back side in blue. Uh, you are working on two different projects. You have work on spinach with iron and you work on, on this one. I wonder which one you get the most joy out of. <laughs> I like to eat spinach. How fast are you scanning a page and what is the distance from your beam to the page? Well, the, um, the scanning speed is as follows. We, we have about a resolution corresponding to 600 DPI, which is, uh, if you, if you um, th that's actually a rather good resolution for imaging for those who are interested in the, the newest computer screens. Now you can get even a 1200 DPI high D. But 600 DPI corresponds to the size of about 40 microns. And on one uh, Archimedes page, which the origin is about this size, you can calculate there are about 15 million pixels of 40 microns. So if you want to have any chance to measure this in faster than a couple of years, you, you need to be fast. So currently, we image with a speed of about 3 milliseconds per pixel. So we are scanning through and we're reading out all our different channels of the signal at every 3 milliseconds. And we, we had a problem, and we, this problem was solved only between the last run and the current run, because we had a dead time and we had a, a, a transfer problem. And now we have, uh, thanks to one of our engineers at SSRL, Alex, uh, he found out a way to actually not transfer every readout, but to bunch them together and wait until the end of the line. At the end of the line, we have to stop for a short moment, uh, because we have to stop go to the next line and then start again. And so that leaves us about maybe a tenth of a second. And in that tenth of a second, he shuffles all the data across. So right now, we basically, our only limit right now is actually the mechanical speed of our stage. So we, we, in principle, we can go faster. Last night, we realized when you start to go too fast, uh, the parchment is, after all, extremely delicate. So it is not held very strongly. It is held within polypropylene windows. And last night, all of a sudden, we saw like two or three lines, and we thought, I was afraid that our stage had failed. Uh, um, Alex was afraid that the transmission had failed. And what really had happened, the parchment had slipped in, inside the holder. And so I think we are very close now to the mechanical limit how fast we can image. And it still takes us, it still takes us about 12 hours to do one page. Um, if I remember the, the evolution of the... Um of the uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator. Originally, we were, we were using these electrons to, to bang into atoms and find out what came out. And this whole uh, radiation thing was kind of a parasitic drag, and we That's didn't cool. like it. And all of a sudden, somebody found a use for it. Are we still using those electrons for anything anymore? I mean, do we really have, uh, you know, is this, <laughs> it sounds like this uh, is, still this is taking over the whole function. Well, at the, at the spear ring, uh, the spear ring, which is now called spear three, uh, that it is now a dedicated source for synchrotron radiation. Um, the, there, are, um, there are still facilities. Well, first of all, the electron accelerators have become bigger, as you, as you probably know very well. The largest one is at CERN with about 30 kilometers circumference, and they have just upgraded it. Um, and they are thinking of building new ones, and they have to be much, much larger. Uh, the next linear collider, for example, will be an enormously large machine. But there are still, um, as far as I know, the Cornell High Energy Synchrotron Source is still operated in parasitic mode. So they have four synchrotron lights on the electrons and positrons, and they still collide the beams. 
And what it means for the, for the X-ray researchers is that the, that, that the life, what we call the lifetime of the, of the current is shorter, so they have to refill once per hour. But it is still a very good source for high energy physics as well as for synchrotron radiation. Most of them are now dedicated to synchrotron radiation. What is the size of the page? This is the, this is the size of, an, uh, of the prayer book page, and the original size of the, an Archimedes page was, was twice. The person who palimpsested, palimpsesting means scrape and write again. What he did is he, he took two pages. This was the original Archimedes copy. He took, took them in part, turned it around, took lemon juice to erase as well as he could the ancient writing, and then rebound them into new pages. And so his book was then half the size. And we still have, so some of them we have just the half page, which, is, which we call folio. And in other cases, we still have the bifolio. Right now we are scanning a bifolio. At the moment, as I speak, we have a, still a bifolio s scanning around. And the difficulty is that because Archimedes wrote across, I mean, he wrote from here in one column all the way, I mean, not Archimedes, the, 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 the scribe who, who did that copy of the Archimedes work, wrote across all the way here. Now, the, the prayer book is bound like this. So when you now bound it and bind it and glue it, you're going to lose some of that inside here. And in fact, you see there's, a, there's, a, there's an example on this poster. Some of them have ripped out the pages, and so some of the stubs remained in the back, but these stubs are extremely valuable because they still have, Archi they still have Archimedes text on them. And we have also in this run about uh, three days ago, we are imaging those stubs, and we find letters and words, and then we bring them together with the, mi with the missing pages. So that's about the size. Do you know yet uh, whether the owner is going to permit you to complete the, the entire document, uh, or is this still in question? What I've heard is that uh, when the owner landed the manuscript to the Walters Art Museum, he said two things. One, I don't want to pay more than what I've paid for the, for the book. And it is well known he paid $2 million for it. Second, he said the project should possibly finish in 10 years. That was in 1998. So we have a, I would call it a soft deadline. Um, the owner might think it's a hard deadline. I don't know the answer to that, um, uh, of, uh, to, of 2008. I would be surprised that either the owner or the scholars w would cut uh, this project short if, if there's any hope to, fi to, to find anything new. Are you worried about the intensity that the parchment is receiving from the X-ray? And at what energy actually is the X-ray? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yes, we are worried about it. Um, what we have done is, w before the project started, we, we have done some tests with other parchment in order to establish a safe dose at which we can expose the parchment without seeing a change. Th that was done in an extremely careful way. Um, the, the parchment was exposed with certain doses, and then the fibers, small parts, were investigated. and. The, change, the observed changes were compared to heating up another piece of parchment, and, and you knew that every parchment has a characteristic temperature at which it starts to shrink. For example, some of the pages of the Archimedes palimpsest, and they have done tiny samples of that, start at a temperature of about 45 degrees Celsius, and I apologize, I only know the Celsius value. They, st they start to shrink, and others at around already 37, 50. And we have, we have established that uh, if we stay with, with, with our parchment below the 40, the number of 40, that is considered a safe dose. What that means is, at the current beam power we have, we cannot stay even one second on the parchment. So we have, at the end of each line, we quickly insert a shutter just before the line ends. It's a pneumatic fast shutter. And then when the parchment stops, and it stops only for a fraction of a second, shutter is closed, moves up, it starts to run again, and then the shutter opens. So, so th this is a concern. And the second question was the excitation energy. Uh, currently, we excited 8 keV, which is well above the iron edge. 
and we are planning to go later on tonight we are planning to look at some copper so we will go to 10 kV and hopefully uh, by um, after tomorrow night and and most of you probably know that tomorrow night at four uh, tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock there will be a live uh, web cast at the exploratorium where we will put in uh, we, we plan to put in folio 64 which is a forgery page we have never looked at um, it has work on the uh, method of mechanical theorems and after that is over we want to switch to maybe do some lower energy excitations we might go down to about 4 kV. It's a, this is fascinating. Um, are you saving any of the document for sciences later on to do something even more spectacular? First of all, the, the document, the, the, the book itself is of course sa saved. And second of all, all of, the, uh, all of the images, whether it's based on x-rays or on the other techniques or even optical images, are all saved. And I've never, I mean, I've, I'm doing x-ray experiments since about 15 years. I have never seen a team which is as meticulous and organized in saving any single detail of the experiments. So soon, within the next three years, you can go probably to some website and look at page 135. Not only will you see the original a photo of the original image, you will see a f the best photo maybe of an X-ray image, the best photo of a multispectral image, and then you might be able to click on that X-ray image and see maybe even the original data. So this is done in an extremely careful way in order to be preserved for many years to come. I just want to follow up on a question over there. Uh, aren't there still high energy physics experiments uh, being performed at SLAC? Does anyone know or think that any new mathematics that no one has ever seen before will be discovered? The, um, the, the method of mechanical theorems uh, from Heiberg's transcription, we know already now that his transcription is not, not uh, completely accurate, which means that um, what he was trying to do probably as anyone is fi filling in some of the gaps what he couldn't read with his own interpretation. Now from, the n from newer images, um, we, we have learned that some of those interpretations are, are incorrect and that, that, that is not a surprise because it's very hard to interpret or try to inter interpolate the thoughts of, of a genius. And I would, say, I would uh, answer this question to, as far as I know. Um, once, the, the full, once the full method is transcribed, if it ever will be fully transcribed, um, I think there is no doubt that, that some, um, may, maybe not important to the, to the modern mathematics, but certainly to, to better understand what the way how Archimedes was viewing uh, the ancient world will be revealed. How much of the text so far has been untranslatable due to the difference in strokes that you mentioned? I, I think that is, in fact, not a uh, large problem. That was more a problem with, the, uh, with what, what the scholars call the colophon, which is um, the, a very you know, artful way of signing, signing off who, who wrote, uh, who commissioned and wrote the prayer book. Um, as far as I know, um, there, there hasn't been a big problem. I should also point out, when you, when you later pick up your x-ray page, uh, and it will look something like this, uh, look in the, in the left bottom corner. Um, the, the monk had, had drawn a hand pointing towards his text, and no one knew about it, so, so this came out as a little surprise from our x-ray image. It's a beautiful little drawing of a hand. So, but no, it is not a big problem. Yeah, this presumably opens the door to scanning all sorts of documents or parchments for underlying more uh, older texts. Is there any quick and easy way to decide if there's any underlying text before you go through the synchrotron process? Um, yes. The, before you bring, if suppose you have a book and you suspect that there is an underlying test, you can go to, an, um, to a conventional x-ray machine, which are actually a lot of museums have them, and you do an elemental analysis. You use maybe a rhodium 20 kV x-ray beam, and, and you, um, you put, you, you don't really image, but you, you choose a point where you want to look, 
and you collect, probably you have to collect uh, for a couple of hours because the intensity is much weaker, but that's fine. And then after that, you will get an X-ray spectrum and it tells you all the elements which are in there. If you find an element which, which, which you don't suspect in the, ink, uh, in the, in the parchment itself, you, you might be up for something. And, and at that point, that would be a good time to contact us and then we can get into business. <laughs> Have you considered uh, moving the beam rather than moving the object? No, it is too difficult. We, we, it's like uh, you know, turning the house rather than the key. So we, we, rather, we, don't, we don't do that. Uh, why did the owner pay two million for the text? Did he or she know it was Archimedes' yes. work yes. already? Yes, that was known at the time. Thank you for letting me ask another question. Uh, about the ink, the uniformity of the ink in terms of its contents, yes. the, the, the calcium or iron, etc., particle size and orientations throughout the text. Have you kind of checked out if the you know different qualities of inks were used, and are the pages different? Were the pages added later? You know things like that. That gives a uh, some idea idea of what it is. And the another one is, have you looked at tunneling uh, uh, techniques to look at the you know images? At what techniques? T I tunneling, know. tunneling. Tunneling techniques? Yeah. Oh, well, uh, uh, let me answer first the second question. The, 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 size, uh, the size is, uh, um, if, I, if I understand you correctly, you might refer to tun tunneling microscopy. But, but the size of, the, of these letters is, is rather... Uh, almost macroscopic in that respect. So a, r a regular uh, microscopic image actually will do to tell you about the um, about the conf uh, you know about indenture, etc. But it is true that my colleague, who is actually here as well at the moment, um, um, Bill uh, Christiansberry, he is actually using a technique called confocal imaging, where he looked whether he can pick out um, the, uh, an Archimedes character versus a prayer book character by looking at different, different depths of the parchment. And from, I've, from what I've learned from him is the difficulty is actually in the, in the scanning speed. It's a very difficult and slow process. So, so in terms of a practical application, that might be limited to that. The yeah, the particle sizes, they vary strongly. And if you later have a chance, um, I'm, I'm not sure that, no, it doesn't come out so clear on the handout. But if you have a chance to go to the website and then and then magnify one of those images, you will see actually that the uh, prayer book text looks completely different uh, in terms of the iron content than the Archimedes text. It has a lot of iron on the sides. It looks almost like a... Um, and whereas the Archimedes text is, is like much smoother. And so that already helps you to see the difference. Plus we are lucky that they wrote perpendicular to each other. So that helps us as well. The person who did the palimpsest uh, obviously didn't know the value of the work or it wouldn't, he wouldn't have taken lemon juice to it. So um, the question I have is, do we know how or why Archimedes' work was not preserved or passed along throughout the ages? Well, first of all, uh, I mean, I would say the, the, the other way around. First of all, it, most of his, or a lot of his work was passed around. And... Um, and the fact that, that a lot of work has survived in Latin translations is a demonstration for that. Second of all, the last person, which was probably in the year 950, who, who copied this version which we have here, uh, that was already at the, not maybe in the middle, but at the beginning of the Dark Ages. And to find an interested enough person, and probably it was in Constantinople, that is thought, to, to take the time to copy one more time uh, one more time, which he didn't know would, have been, would be the last time, uh, this work is remarkable in itself. Um, for the priest, it was an easy decision because to get a, a prayer book of parchment, you needed a flock of sheep. And um, it was very hard to do so, to, to even, even if you had the sheep, to skin them, dry them, etc. It was ancient recycling, and he had no idea about what he was getting. And in fact, we know that there were five different works in this book, not only by Archimedes. Um, Archimedes is about two-thirds, and there, there are other very important works, uh, and, and I shouldn't say it's too much about it, but we hope we are also trying to crack one of them, but it's ongoing work. 
How did you originally know or who originally knew it was Archimedes writing under the <laughs> prayer book right. text? Yeah. Well, th this was, I mean, the person who, who is uh, um, considered in this context was the Danish scholar Johann Ludwig Heiberg. Um, and that was in, in 1906. Th there was also an earlier story, and, and I would refer you uh, to, to this website where, where the history is described rather well. Um, there was an earlier person with the name of Tischendorf, and it wasn't clear wh whether he was aware, that was in, in the uh, middle of the 19th century, whether he was aware uh, w what he was dealing with. But, but it was clearly Heiberg. And as we speak, the 100th hun anniversary of the discovery of the Archimedes Palimpsest is actually celebrated. Uh, who, who was the person who is associated with, with the discovery that this was text by Archimedes 100 years ago? 1906. Um, how, how much of the book of the Stomachion is contained in there? And in fact, how much of all of the books? I know there are pieces of them. Yes. Uh, I, don't th I, d I cannot answer the question of how much of the Stomachion, but, but I can tell you about the Stomachion that um, Revel Nets, uh, the scholar here at Stanford, uh, has solved the Stomachion puzzle, but he is also very interested to bring it back to look with x-rays. And it is in such poor shape that the pages are literally falling apart in your hands. So we have to come up with a very clever way to hold it, and not only to hold it, also to bring it, maybe not completely upright, but at an angle, so that we can image it. My hope is that it will happen, but we don't know yet. And, th and that would be great. I think it would be great for, you know, for, for, the, for the understanding of it. But, but in, in, in terms of how much, uh, in, in number of pages, I cannot tell you. But again, I would like uh, to refer you to the website. I think there, uh, there are links where, where you can find out about this. Is iron, are the traces of iron preserved in the document preferentially over other materials? And are there other metals that, uh, that you should be looking at, other heavier metals, or is, which, which might help differentiate right. between the... 9th century and 12th century days? Yes. Well, that, that's an excellent question. And in fact, later on, um, maybe in the next two hours, we are going to look at some copper as well. Iron is, is the, uh, you know, one of the most abundant of the metals. And, and uh, so it is clearly the number one. But, but there are other metals as well. Um, um, some of them, for example, the zinc and um, also some barium, some titanium, some manganese. The manganese typically comes together with the iron. Um, and some of them uh, came, for example, the forgeries, of course, they came much later. Uh, and there are some trace elements. Last night, we looked at the spectrum. We thought we might have seen some arsenic. Um, th there are more, but, but they are all in rather, compared to the iron, they are in, in rather small quantities. So not that helpful for our imaging at this point. I think uh, we'll make this the last question before we let Uwe get back to his beam line and his new <laughs> document. Um, I was just curious, is any attempt being made to keep track of the Latin prayers that were written over it? I mean, I know that's a little, yeah. sorry, I didn't yeah. want to waste well, your last question, but is it like No, I think it's, well it's an excellent question. They're not Latin, they're, they're also Greek. And, and yes, uh, and scholars are studying the, them as well. So um, th that is not lost. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.